Imagine a world with waterless showers, mirrorless vanities, and doorless mansions. Everyone would be stinky, ugly, and robbed. Unless, of course, that world was Barbie Land, a place where everyone is clean, beautiful, and safe. A confectionery colored utopia that asked the question, what would the world look like without patriarchy? In Barbie Land, the only emotion is elation. There is no sadness or evil or thoughts of death. The worst insult you could get is weird. In Barbie Land, women don't have jobs, they have careers that they are passionate about. In Barbie Land, there aren't starter homes, but dream houses complete with hot pink slides instead of stairs. And in Barbie Land, no one eats, but if they did, I'm certain it would be a heaping plate of girl dinner. This is my meal, I call this girl dinner. The latest and greatest symbol of female autonomy. Girl dinner is a glass of wine and a bowl of popcorn. Girl dinner is a pickle and a diet coke. Girl dinner is a block of cheese with too few crackers. Girl dinner does not require you to turn on the oven or stove or serve anyone else. Girl dinner is practical. Girl dinner is joyful. Girl dinner is freedom. And like any other food trend, girl dinner originated on TikTok. Cannot find the TikTok right now, but a girl just came on here and said how like in medieval times, peasants had to eat nothing but bread and cheese and how awful that was. And she was like, that's my ideal meal. This is my dinner. I call this girl dinner. Girl dinner is like an adult lunchable or an unpretentious charcuterie board. At face value, the idea of scrounging up peanuts, dried fruit, and expired Halloween candy for dinner seems lazy, but at its core, in a world where women have historically been tasked with the reproductive labor that is cooking, the popularity of girl dinner is kind of revolutionary. It's an edible manifestation of how far women have come. It represents a single, independent career woman who doesn't have to answer to anyone but herself. The kind of woman who paints her house 50 shades of pink for the heck of it. The kind of woman for whom a husband is just an accessory. The kind of woman who is, well, Barbie. The Barbie movie is as visually satisfying as girl dinner is satiating. That is to say, extremely. The production design is impeccably detailed and the costumes will inspire Halloween looks for years to come. The star-studded cast was also a home run. Margot Robbie's Archbeat alone will probably get her an Oscar nomination. Ryan Gosling's performance as a self-serious himbo is amazing. America Ferreira's knack for sincerity needs to be studied. And Kate McKinnon made me wish that Weird Barbie had more screen time. While the visual landscape of Barbie was dripping with detail, I wish that same level of care was devoted to the story, namely the stakes. The threats Barbie faced in the movie didn't seem to have major consequences. Of course, the main threat was the Kendom taking over Barbie land, but it seemed unnatural how easily the Barbies were duped out of their power to begin with. It was like taking candy from a baby. Ken learned about men on horses, and in the next scene, all these intelligent Barbies decided to succumb to his wishes without a fight. Even the Mattel corporate goons didn't seem to pose any real harm to Barbie. They threatened to put her in a box, but we never actually knew where that would lead her. Finally, the threat of not looking perfect was existential because beauty was the core, if not the only aspect, of stereotypical Barbie's identity. However, the consequence was ending up as a weird Barbie. And sure, in Barbie land, being called weird is equivalent to having the cheese touch, but honestly, weird Barbie was one of the most interesting characters in the movie, not the ostracized outcast the normal Barbies made her out to be. I mean, who wouldn't want to live in a colorful mansion with a dog who has perfectly shaped plastic poops? Before seeing Barbie, I actually watched The Wizard of Oz since it was one of Greta Gerwig's main references. I had never seen it before, and of course I knew there'd be a happy ending because it's a PG movie from 1939, but I was still genuinely scared for Dorothy and Toto. It always felt satisfying when they overcame challenges because they weren't too easily resolved. I didn't feel that same level of suspense while watching Barbie, but I really wanted to. 
Thank you AG1 for sponsoring this portion of the video. AG1 is a daily foundational nutrition supplement that supports whole body health. I like to incorporate AG1 into my wellness routine after several beige food days. It makes me feel good knowing that there's something green and nutritious going into my body. It has vitamin C and zinc to support overall immune health. Also, I tend to struggle with inconsistent energy levels throughout the day, but the Rhodiola, Magnesium, and B vitamins in AG1 help sustain my energy without the caffeine crash I get from coffee. Head to the link in my description below to get a free one-year supply of AG vitamin D3 plus K2 plus five AG1 travel packs with your first purchase of AG1. Okay, back to Barbie. Greta Gerwig was tasked not just with making a movie about a controversial piece of IP, but addressing its contradictions in the film. It's kind of like asking a Paw Patrol movie to answer for the evils of police brutality. Barbie dolls were progressive because they allowed girls to dream big and imagine a life beyond motherhood. At the same time, they created unrealistic beauty standards, and the endless accessories seemed less about cultivating a sense of possibility in young girls and more about cultivating a sense of consumerism. Nevertheless, as we see from the movie's Space Odyssey-inspired opening sequence, Barbie dolls helped kids who were forced to grow up too fast reclaim their girlhood a desire that has been slowly bubbling to the surface of social media with trends like girl dinner. Greta Gerwig weaves this theme into the narrative of Gloria, a glum middle-aged mother who, desperate for joy, turns to playing with her daughter's old Barbie doll. Barbie also dives headfirst into themes of feminism and existentialism, all under what I imagine was the corporate microscope of Mattel. It's why the movie's lasting message is also, unsurprisingly, the Barbie slogan. You can be anything. Whether it's an ordinary Barbie, an extraordinary girl, or a young woman who is supporting her immune system with the help of AG1. The movie starts with Margot Robbie as stereotypical Barbie performing what has to be the most delightful morning routine of all time. Soon after, we are introduced to the rest of Barbie land, that is to say the various Barbies and Kens and of course, Alan. When Barbie suddenly begins to malfunction, aka her feet go flat and her thighs contract cellulite, she must venture to the real world and find the human who is putting their physical and emotional afflictions on her tiny shoulders. Ken tags along on the journey because he has nothing better to do, and once the pair reach the real world, Barbie is in for a rude awakening, while Ken embraces it with open arms. Barbie land is a perfect society ruled by independent women, while the real world is run by a peculiar system called patriarchy. Inspired by the men on horses, Ken inexplicably pulls off a coup and turns Barbie land into a rudimentary patriarchal society called Kendom. Meanwhile, Barbie teams up with the human who caused her to malfunction, Gloria, and her tween daughter, Sasha, to attempt to restore Barbie land to the status quo all while evading the advances of Mattel executives and confronting the apparition of her inventor, Ruth Handler. Like I mentioned before, the production design is amazing. There are so many incredible details like the pop-up ambulance complete with heart-shaped x-rays and the pink house that I wanted to take a bite out of. The soundtrack seamlessly blended with the aesthetic thanks to bubblegum-inspired bops from Lizzo, Charlie XCX, Nicki Minaj, and more. The tone, despite moments of self-aware satire and existentialism, remains buoyant as expected by a PG-13 blockbuster about a toy. And the performances strike a chord that, in the most complimentary way, feel plastic. The Barbies manage to lack introspection in a way that feels endearing but not ditzy. In terms of the box office, Barbie was groundbreaking, but I felt like the story could have dug a bit deeper. The relationship between Gloria and her daughter Sasha could have been a whole movie in and of itself, a tween Southern California set ladybird, but their backstory felt crammed into a few forlorn-looking flashbacks. Also because there was such an emphasis on the Barbie Ken gender binary, I wish Alan's backstory was more highlighted. What does it mean that he is the only man in Barbie land who is not a Ken? 
I wanted more Michael Sarah. I didn't dislike the Barbie movie, but I wanted to like it a lot more than I did. The aspect that left a less than sweet taste in my mouth is how it approached feminism. Don't worry, I'm not going to say this movie was ruined by being woke, which I don't actually think is a real criticism. If anything, I felt like Barbie had a bit more waking up to do. Stereotypical Barbie is far from intersectional because everything in the movie boiled down to a binary, men versus women. The Barbie land represented in the movie is that of the post-Mattel diversity overhaul. We see Barbies of all different skin tones, sizes, and abilities, but those differences aren't acknowledged because in Barbie land, all women are created equal while the Kens are second-class citizens. So maybe asking stereotypical Barbie to promote intersectionality is too tall in order. However, it seems like something Gloria, America Ferrera's character, should have been able to express because Ferrera herself has been outspoken about intersectional feminism. As a woman and as a proud first generation American born to Honduran immigrants, we demand an end to the systemic murder and incarceration of our black brothers and sisters. Her monologue about the plights and paradoxes of womanhood under the patriarchy is impeccably delivered, but it rings hollow without acknowledging the fact that these circumstances are exacerbated and different when you have more than one marginalized identity. While some of the feminist messaging felt strained, the theme that felt most authentic is the one Barbie eventually lands on. You don't have to be everything, and it's okay to be ordinary. I think the movie itself could have taken some notes from this. It felt like it was trying to be everything, everywhere, all at once. A Mattel ad, a feminist masterpiece, a subversive satire, a heartfelt mother-daughter narrative, a fish-out-of-water comedy, and for like 10 minutes, a car commercial. There were so many interesting characters and storylines, but it felt like they couldn't all comfortably fit within the sub two hour runtime. The Barbie movie wasn't revolutionary, but given its corporate constraints, it probably was never going to be. I guess that's the irony of big budget IP. There are unlimited resources, but at what creative cost? Um, also, that's the irony of studio CEOs making hundreds of millions of dollars and acting like giving thousands of workers even a fraction of their salary is the end of the world. Anyway, like Girl Dinner, Barbie does deserve credit for encouraging women to reclaim their girlhood. When else besides Halloween do we see droves of women dressed up in pink for the fun of it? Ultimately, Barbie is at its best when it remembers to play.